Good evening. I'm um, Crystal Parikh, the director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU, and it's um, my pleasure to welcome you to our final event of the semester, Imperial Entanglements, Permanent Conditions of War in the Pacific. Um, before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would also like to recognize that New York is city is currently home to approximately 100,000 people to, who identify as indigenous, including many peoples from, ac um, from across the Pacific. We at the Institute affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Thank you. So tonight's event is, our year, is um, part of our year-long focus of the, at the Institute um, on the theme In the Wake of War, in which we um, consider the many different kinds of war that have shaped our community's existence, as well as the relations of solidarity and care forged in the face and aftermath of violence. We look forward to continuing our collaboration on this theme with our artist in residence, Ocean Vuong, in the spring. And we encourage you to stay updated um, and on this and other APA Institute activities by following us on social media at APA Institute on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And you can also sign up to receive our newsletter on um, our website or at the registration table. We'd also like to thank the NYU Native Studies Forum and the Asian Pacific American Studies Program in the NYU Department of Social and Cultural Analysis for their generous co-sponsorship of the program. Um, I'd like to offer my own personal thanks to the staff at the APA Institute for their work on tonight's event and throughout this semester for having put together such a um, successful slate of programming. Um, after tonight's discussion, we invite you to say, stay for the reception and continue the conversation. And books are available at the, um, via the NYU Bookstore, which is set up in the lobby so you can purchase those. And I'd like to turn over the mic at this point to Dean Saranilia, uh, my colleague in um, social and cultural analysis, who will be mo moderating the program and providing some framing remarks. Dean Itsuji um, Saranilio is associate professor in Department of Social <coughs> and Cultural Analysis. His teaching and research interests are in, the, um, in settler colonialism and critical indigenous studies, Asian American and Pacific Island histories, and cultural studies. He is the author of Unsustainable Empire, Alternative Histories of Hawaii Statehood, um, which was published last year by Duke University Press, which is also available for purchase um, this evening. As, um, and please welcome Dean to the uh, podium. Thank you. Such an old picture of me. <laughs> That's what I used to look like. <laughs> so, aloha kako, half a day. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, I'm very honored to be moderating tonight's panel, um, Imperial Entanglements, Permanent Conditions of War in the Pacific. And we are very fortunate to have two formidable scholars whose work helps us to think more precisely about how to make our movements and writing more effective and deliberate at dismantling empire in all of its complex iterations. And so I don't want to take up too much time in introducing our speakers tonight. Um, as Lisa and Keith both th think through their projects with each other, uh, they both quote and cite each other in their books. Uh, Lisa wrote a beautiful blurb for Keith's book. Um, and so I imagine that it will be very obvious to everyone uh, why uh, their books are paired together tonight. Uh, but as a scholar from Hawaii, in rereading their books, it has helped me to better understand uh, a particular issue of life or death that is currently being argued over in Hawaii right now. And so after the Japanese quote-unquote surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in the summer of 1941, uh, the U.S. Navy determined that they needed to hide the massive amount of fuel that was needed for its Navy and Air Force in case of another military attack. And so nine months later, the military and what is celebrated as an engineering marvel successfully hollowed out a mountain ridge commonly called Red Hill and buried 20 incredibly large fuel tanks, each tank described as larger than Aloha Tower with a capacity to hold a quarter billion gallons of fuel. This engineering marvel, however, was placed directly above the aquifer or water source for the entire island of Oahu. In 2014, 27,000 gallons of jet fuel was leaked into the aquifer, and petroleum can be detected in the water source for the island. So they explain that petroleum can be found in the aquifer, but they deny that petroleum can be found in the drinking water, and even though this is the same exact source, source of water. 
<clears throat> and so the existence of these tanks was declassified in the late 90s, so it's unclear as to how many other leaks had taken place. The Navy, however, refuses to find another location for its tanks, saying that they will continue to use this underground fueling source and complete modifications of its tanks by 2045. That military necessity can trump, pun intended, the water of nearly a million people uh, on an island 2,500 miles away might be baffling to some. But the work of Lisa and Keith help us to understand the power of American exceptionalism and seeming indebtedness to supposed liberators that uphold the fascist power of military colonies. So even when there, meaning the military's very existence puts into jeopardy the lives they purport to protect, and this is itself tied to a wide range of movements currently taking place, so against either the US military itself or militarized police forces. So whether we're talking about the military buildup in Guahan, seeking to place a live fire military training site above the island's aquifer, or Mauna Kea, and the protection of the crown of the island's aquifer, and just behind, uh, just below Puhonua, Puluhulu, Hulu, uh, where the kupuna where the elders are blocking the road so that the, uh, tel the telescopes can't reach up. Just beneath there is Puakuloa, which is where the live fire training takes place. Um, or we can also look to Standing Rock and the continued oil leaks that are taking place there, which is also above an aquifer. And so the permanent conditions of war in the Pacific comes at the expense of the very conditions of life. And the movements that Lisa and Keith speak about and are a part of give us a fighting chance. And so we are very fortunate to have them with us tonight. Um, I'm just gonna read their bios uh, in the order that they're speaking. So Lisa Yoneyama is professor of East Asian studies and women and gender studies at the University of Toronto. Her publications on memory, violence, and justice include Hiroshima Traces, Time, Space, and the Dialectics of Memory, a co-edited volume, uh, Perilous Memories, Asian, Asia Pacific Wars, um, Violence, War, Redress, Politics of Multiculturalism, which is uh, printed in Japanese, and Cold War Ruins, the Trans-Pacific Critique of American Justice and Japanese War Crimes, which received a 2018 Best Book Award in Humanities and Cultural Studies presented by the Association for Asian American Studies. Her research has been supported by uh, numerous prestigious fellowships, uh, which you can read about in the program. Uh, and prior to joining the University of Toronto in 2011, she taught cultural studies in the literature department at the University of Cali California, San Diego, where she also served as program director for Japanese studies and critical gender studies. Uh, Keith Camacho is associate professor in the Asian American Studies Department and a faculty affiliate in the Critical Race Studies program at UCLA. He is the author of Sacred Men, Law, Torture, and Retribution in Guam, the co-editor of Militarized Currents Toward a Decolonized Future in Asia and the Pacific, and the former senior editor of Amerija Journal, uh, which he was uh, editor, senior editor of between 2013 and 2018. Uh, he is now researching the cultural, political, and racial formation of native youth gangs in Auckland and LA from the 1960s to the 1990s. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lisa and Keith. It's actually a great honor to be here um, with Keith. Um, he had taught me so much. Um, he says that I helped him, but it's actually, well, reciprocal. But you, I learned so much from his work, so it's really an honor to be here. Um, my book has been up for a while, so um, ma many of you might actually already know um, what, what it is. But I, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of give an overview, which would become sort of a background, a broader background to uh, Keith's um, uh, talk uh, from his book. Um, let's see, do I just um, click this, like this? Okay, so um, the book actually uh, came out uh, of many, many different engagements, and it's, um, it, it is hard to tell, um, you know, where was the real original starting point, but the um, sort of larger framework really came um, uh, out of uh, 2001 uh, ASA uh, uh, session. Uh, on comfort women and knowledge. And Candice Chu actually did a uh, guest editor and did a, a 2003 uh, special issue of Journal Asian American Studies. Um, so, and uh, Laura Khan, Candice Chu, and myself contributed three pieces uh, to really critiquing um, comfort women issues or the discourse of a comfort women issue, which was really become Asian Americanized and Americanized, um, really moving from you know Northeast Asia uh, to US context. Um, and 
we sort of did the uh, critique of it. Uh, so it sort of comes out of that. Um, so uh, one of the main topics is really Americanization of justice, um, not just justice in terms of transitional justice after World War II, but also uh, justice in terms of gender justice, racial justice, uh, you know, world justice, really. Uh, and so the ni and my focus is really 1990s um, redress movements, um, and I'm talking about it in terms of um, new Americanization moment. So um, that's the uh, context that I, um, I uh, my book uh, was uh, really uh, context out of which my book uh, really came about. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my book is really about clarifying um, the sort of predicament of justice, um, you know, in terms of um, the kind of new redress movement that was emerging in the 1990s to address um, issues of um, uh, uh, military and colonial violence committed by the former Japanese Empire, uh, as well as uh, other related uh, war and colonial violences. Um, in concrete, um, I consider the, um, sorry, this was meant to be, uh, I made this slide when I think I'm just going to talk, but I decided to um, read for the sake of time. Um, so in concrete, I consider that uh, post-90s articulation, articulation of historical justice um, has in one way or another interrogated the structures that took hold of the world after World War II. The post-conflict transition of justice in the aftermath of Asia-Pacific War was predominantly choreographed and led by the United States. It has not only rendered certain violences illegible, it is unredressable. It also left many colonial legacies intact. Post-90s redress culture reveals the disavowed history of violence, complicity, and other problematic Cold War legacies. So, um, there is a kind of uh, what you can identify as the architecture of uh, post-World War II transitional justice, and it is all sort of um, uh, prepared and established during the Cold War. So, of course, there is Tokyo War Crime Tribunal, uh, and as well as uh, multilateral San Francisco Treaty, um, which officially, quote unquote, settled um, all the uh, war reparation issues. Um, and that is really the official stance that uh, Japanese government has been taking, as well as um, all the um, countries that signed the treaties. Um, therefore, people call this Cold War architecture of post-war to transitional justice uh, San Francisco system or uh, Cold War arrangements uh, under the San Francisco Peace Treaty. Um, and then in addition, there are uh, bilateral uh, state, state normalization treaty, uh, for instance, 1965 uh, South Korea-Japan uh, basic treaty, which uh, is in the news. I'm sure people who are following it understand the problem uh, that comes with the treaty, um, as well as uh, joint communique um, normalization between uh, People's Republic of China and Japan. Um, so this is uh, the sort of quick uh, overview of the uh, architecture of Cold War justice. Uh, but what it is, is it's really um, the, um, the resistance or opposition to this earlier moment of normalization, peace treaties, um, this Cold War settlement, um, really had always been, has always been a kind of undercurrent of oppositional politics. Um, if you look at South Korea, it has always been sort of undercurrent for pro-democratic uh, forces. Um, but so what I'm trying to really argue here uh, in my book and throughout is post-90s or 1990s redress um, as an attempt to sort of, you know, redress the Cold War redress, uh, so to speak. Um, at the a transition, uh, as at the transitional justice in the immediate aftermath of World War II, um, we find not only that the Allied powers liberated the area formerly occupied and colonized by the Japanese Empire, but the United States' ascendance to the military supremacy in what has been termed the Cold War Empire for Liberty. Having liberated much of Asia and Pacific Islands from Japanese Empire, um, Japanese Empire, the United States also managed the post ceasefire transitional justice, racial emancipation, and gender equality. At the same time, it further mil militarized and began to nuclearize the region while forging anti-communist networks linking the military security free market client state in North and Southeast Asia. Uh, U.S. hegemony in post-war Asia and Pacific region rested on the Americanization justice and its ability to govern through its rhetoric of liberty, freedom, 
an American sacrifice to bring world democracy. Uh, so in the book, I look at different sites that seem to be like sort of a linchpin. Um, one of the, um, the first two chapters, we're looking at the space of uh, two different kinds of occupation. Um, you know, they're both occupied by U.S., uh, but the trajectory is quite different. So Okinawa still remains uh, settler colonial uh, uh, condition, uh, you know, by the Japanese government, uh, by being part of the, ja under the Japanese sovereignty, but at the same time, it is a kind of a military colony in the uh, uh, way that uh, um, uh, Keith talks about. So, um, but uh, on the other hand, the mainland uh, part of Japan was under occupation, but sort of rehabilitated as a uh, democratic um, um, uh, space. So uh, I'm not going to the detail of each chapters, but I looked at different sites um, that seem to be sort of a crucible of uh, these kind of redress activism as well as disputes. Um, Put it differently, culture on historical justice at the turn of the new century can be read as an index of the deeply entangled, enduring inter-imperial complex of historical violence that was disavowed in the initial phase of transitional justice, yet which was then protracted into our late colonial, late capitalist world. In my reading, post-90s readers' culture contains profound critique of the way the trans-Pacific arrangement of covert justice has set the parameters of what can be known as violence and whose violence on which bodies can be addressed and redressed. They shed light on what anthropologist Alan Feldman saw as the longue durée of structural violence of race racial, gender, sexual, and ethnic inequities, unquote, um, that is part of the origin of violence and its unredressability. And to the extent that the post-90s discourse on historical justice exposed the limit of the state um, to the state, um, limit of the state to represent its subjects um, and thereby disturbs the normativity of modern nation states and their authentic belonging, the heated public debates and the memories of violence within redress culture have necessarily been transnational. Not surprisingly then, the redress culture cases um, and the memories of violence they evoke have instigated intense culture wars or struggles over and against the state's desire to protect, quote unquote, the sanctity of community, family, and nation to borrow from Roderick Ferguson. And among this, um, uh, the Cold War architecture, um, I think the good war narrative has been one of the sort of instrumental key um, uh, discursive backbone. Um, the good war narrative um, assumed uh, that prior to the war, Japan was a nation lagging in modernity and that it had failed to cultivate its latent potential to embrace liberal ideals until it was vanquished militarily and then reborn under U.S. benevolence benevolent supremacy, quote unquote. Area studies knowledge about Japan produced during the transwar decade uh, and its modernization theory gave academic credibility to this dimension of good war narrative. With regard to the U.S. disavowal of formal colonialism and white supremacy in the Cold War competition over discourse, which was aimed at an audience made up primarily of post-colonial nation states and domestic racial minorities, the fact that the defeated and rehabilitated enemy was a non-white, non-Western nation took on, a sp took on special significance in a way that was unfathomable in the Atlantic front. Presenting the United States as a magnan magnanimous victor, the good war master narrative lent truthfulness to the image of the United States as the benefactor of equality, freedom, and democracy to nations of color throughout the world. The, in the Good War narrative, Japan was to be included, though, um, through the process of what Jody Kim summarized as the gendered ra racial rehabilitation into a biopolitical space of American governmentality. The Good War narrative of liberation and universal rights may have helped consolidate the Cold War knowledge about the war and the meaning of post-war American justice, but if Japan was constituted as the site of the successful American project of liberation, rehabilitation, and integration, such a narrative omitted all but, all but the metropolitan core of the vast Japanese empire. It also had to strategically write out other important histories, that is, U.S. advancement into the post-colonial space that emerged after the Japanese Empire's collapse. 
as sociologist Henry Kwan reminds us, in many areas formerly under Japanese imperial rule, the Allied occupation was often synonymous with con continuing states of emergencies of civil wars, counterinsurgency, militarized seizures, and martial law. In other words, the discursive convention of setting a temporal benchmark at 1945 as the origin of historical progress, peace, and prosperity, which is presented, represented in binary contrast to pre-1945 dispossession, exceptional violence, and underdevelopment, belies the realities of other new imperial geographies of the post-World II world. In this context, um, there are many components, but I wanted to <coughs> just focus on the gendered uh, justice dimension. In this context, <clears throat> uh, it is in this context that the stories about the Japanese women liberated and acquired civil rights under the new constitution were widely disseminated, disseminated as Japan was undergoing various reforms initiated by the US occupation. According to this knowledge, which showcased American-style gender justice, or what I once called Cold War feminism, Japan was on steady path toward becoming a peaceful, democratic, uh, and economically liberal society, and was hence fully deserving of international recognition and reintegration. If the discourse on women's liberation was essential to enabling the Trans-Pacific Cold War's complicity in suppressing the anti-colonial reordering of the world, the Cold War narrative of the Good War and the credibility it conferred on America's benevolent supremacy in the aftermath, in the war's aftermath, continues to find its use value. So short, um, shortly after the, so the quote that I have is um, from 2003, uh, <clears throat> shortly after the U.S. military seizure of Baghdad in April 2003, the Rocky Mountain News featured an art article uh, on a lecture by Beate Shirota Gordon. So everybody who um, is in Japanese um, history or Japanese studies or familiar with Japan would know this name. Um, it is a household name. It is a woman um, who gave a quote-unquote gift to the Japanese women a right to vote and also right to choose a heterosexual partner uh, according to their will. So two gifts that the Shorota Gordon gave to Japanese women, that's how she's known for. But she suddenly um, emerged into the publicity um, after, um, and after the uh, US invasion of uh, Iraq, or in fact, prior to the, um, prior to the US actually invasion, um, there was a Washington Post wrote up that um, US occupation of Iraq will be modeled uh, on um, American occupation of Japan. And this was before the military invasion actually took place. Anyway, the article read, quote, Japanese women who lived through the reconstruction of the country after World War II could help the United States rebuild Iraq and Afghanistan, says the woman who helped General Douglas MacArthur <coughs> write the Japanese constitution, unquote. According to the newspaper's account, Gordon maintained that Japanese women who quote unquote, had no rights prior to the new con constitution are successful in politics and business today. And um, as a colored people, quote unquote, Gordon reportedly noted that they could, quote, bolster U.S. credibility with Iraqis and Af Afghans by demonstrating that the U.S. military occupation did not run their islands into a colony, unquote. The remarkable timeliness of Gordon's public resurgence at the onset of the war against terror, um, <clears throat> war against terror attests to the discursive force of the good war narrative continues to exert in making uh, and justifying America's new wars. So literary critics uh, would do all sorts of things to really read into between the lines and rhetoric. And all. So sometimes you don't really need to do this. Um, this is another <coughs> <coughs> quote from George Will. Um, he said, the most important emancipator of Japanese women was General Douglas MacArthur, who made women's suffrage occupation policy. The liberators of Afghan women wore U.S. battle dress in 2002. Um, so I've been using the term benevolent supremacy, and this is from Melanie McAllister. Um, as American Cold War studies scholar have invariably noted in the global Cold War uh, rivalry, the disavowal of former colonialism and white supremacy became a U.S. Foreign, foreign policy concern of utmost urgency because of the, the need to mobilize the third world countries, many of which were then emerging as new nation states. Yet it often um, goes unaccompanied 
goes unacknowledged that the rhetorical, rhetorical force of the U.S. empire for liberty and its disavowal of racism and colonialism in particular would not have been effective, if, if even possible, without showcasing Japan's post-surrender rehabilitation through America's good war narrative. So um, I'd like to um, uh, insert one um, quote um, from uh, Keith and says Shigematsu's edited volume, Militarized Currents, they said long before the advent of um, the recent militarized conflicts in the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Iraq, the United States has defined its national interest not along the borders of the continent or US, US but in Asia and the Pacific. So um, what I guess what I'm trying to um, do here is to echo uh, with uh, problematizing of this uh, marginalization of Asia and Pacific islands um, uh, and the U US, how they were instrumental in ascendancy of U.S. out Cold War empire and continuing sort of militarized security empire. So I'll read one more passage and I'll close. Um, <coughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, to, uh, in closing, so critical literatures on post-conflict justice have identified the problem of successful redress, quote unquote, successful redress, and clarified the predicaments of law, human rights, and institutionalized justice. Insofar as the dis um, dis discourse of redress and reparations inherently holds out as its telos some form of closure, settlement, and sublation, the official acknowledgement of and accounting for past wrongs within the given institutional venue could risk re-legitimating re that very establishment that offer reparation and apologies. But as I try to demonstrate throughout my book, the same fraught redemptive efforts have simultaneously exposed still unresolved issues that refuse closures uh, and persist beyond formal reconciliation. The very same predicaments and contradictions have sparked the production of redress cultures and political subjects of new socialities who prefer alternative future visions and radically politicized sensibilities for justice. To challenge previously agreed upon terms of settlement is more than an act of uh, <clears throat> correcting initial miscalculations. It calls into question the very cultural assumptions, intellectual premises, and relations of power, according to which history and its meaning have been narrated and accepted as truth. Critical divide between the legibility and illegibility of violence was an integral part of the post-World War II Cold War knowledge formation. Trans-Pacific critique that cuts across the disciplinary divides between Asian studies, American studies, and the disarticulated Pacific indigenous studies begins to um, uh, brings light bring, uh, brings light to the form to this formation and its structuring legacies by scrutinizing the geopolitical shifts as well as inter-imperial com continuities across the transwar period. Through the analytic of trans-Pacific critique, we can see that the post 90s redress culture contains profound critiques of the way the arrangement of Cold War justice has set the parameters of what can be known as violence and whose violence on which body can be addressed and redressed. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Amita. Uh, Dean, Crystal, Laura, Ruby, uh, everybody, you know, you could be doing many, many other things on a Thursday night, but you chose to be with us, and I really appreciate it. Um, writing war crimes uh, in Guam. On January 21st, 1942, Louis Chrysostomo, a 21-year-old Chamorro man, reported to the Japanese police headquarters in Saipan, one of several islands in the Marianas governed by the Nanyo Cho, or the Japanese South Seas government. The United States territory of Guam, the southernmost island in this archipelago, had already fallen to the Japanese military a month earlier. As with American Samoa, Hawaii, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico, the Chamorros of Guam, also called Guamanians, had likewise experienced U.S. colonial governance. When Chrysostomo boarded the vessel Nantaki Maru for Guam in 1942, he thus had no idea that his expertise in the Japanese language would strain the relations between Americanized Chamorros and Japanese Chamorros throughout the archipelago 
Guam being a U.S. Uh, naval colony and Japan being a, I mean, Saipan being a Japanese military colony, cultivating Americanized and Japanese natives, respectively. Once in Guam, he and other Chamorros from the islands of Rota and Saipan were instructed to perform translation duties for the Japanese administrative, agricultural, educational, medical, military, and police units. They all serve one goal, to colonize and change Guamanian attitudes from the American influence and to obey the rules, orders, and regulations of the Japanese, and also to see themselves like Japanese. By 1944, the Japanese had forcibly recruited 75 men and three women as interpreters from the islands of Rhoda and Saipan. The transformation of Louis Chrysostomo from the son of farmers into a proper man of Japanese authority and law had likewise begun. There's two ex execution scenes. The one on, on my right, on the way right, is um, from Rota, or, or your left, and then here on the right is in Guam. One is an a, um, image that was uh, created in the sketch in an interrogation session to the U.S. military courts, and one is a Japanese image of an execution in Guam, a photo. Uh, through interrogations, torture, and torture tactics, and both private and public executions, as noted in the images before you. Chrysostomo often imposed the power of the Japanese sovereign onto the Chamorros of Guam and the entire archipelago. We know, for instance, that he assaulted an elderly woman and mother, beat a young man and moved his, made his bowels move, drowned another man by the way of the water cure, and stabbed and killed a farmer. The Japanese, Japanese military and police, aided and abetted by interpreters like Chrysostomo, therefore executed at least 50 Chamorros in Guam and five Chamorros in Rota. Many more were tortured. Chrysostomo's efforts ceased, however, when the U.S. military invaded Guam in the summer of 1944. A few months later, on January 1st, 1945, the U.S. military police located Chrysostomo and placed him in a stockade. Suspected of committing war crimes against U.S. nationals, he remained in the camp until a military tribunal subpoenaed him for trial on June 4, 1945. Until then, he labored as a prisoner for the U.S. military. As his wife, Marikita, elaborated, quote, my husband told me that while he was in prison, they were taken out on work details, and Gumanians would come up to them and say, you are monkeys now. You beat the Chamorros, and now you are monkeys. Some would say, come here so I can kill you, end quote. In my book, Sacred Men, Law, Torture, and Retribution in Guam, I examined the making of the U.S. Naval Tribunal's program from 1944 to 49. In doing so, I analyzed the convergence of Chamorro proverbs and European philosophies about violence alongside the legal codification of white supremacist notions of property and punishment in the island. That is to say, I offer close readings of war crimes trials about atrocity, murder, prostitution, and treason. More vitally, I also theorize how indigenous and white forms of racism and retribution <coughs> converge as the U.S. rule of law. That's the main intervention in his book, that native testimony, native vengeance, retribution, and the, its, its uh, conflation with uh, white juridical codes around punishment, around possession, manifested as, as U.S. rule of law in what was effectively Japanese sovereign territory. And um, in this respect, I concur with my colleague Lisa uh, in her book, Cold War Ruins, Trans-Pacific Critique of American Justice and Japanese War Crimes, namely that, quote, as Lisa put it, U.S. Cold War policies in the Asia-Pacific region virtually suspended the sovereignty of the peoples whose lives had been most devastated by Japanese aggression, thus preempting the possibility that they might take justice into their, into their own hands, end quote. The tribunal in Guam, a, a precursor to the then emerging U.S. Cold War apparatus, operated in a similar fashion by way of native retribution and naval justice. For today, I discuss how I, come I came to this project about war crimes. Toward this effect, I'll highlight a few of the interviewees, their complex entanglement with the tribunal, and their broader kinship with the militarizing and demilitarizing worlds of the Marianas, 
and the wider Pacific, and I specific say, specifically say kinship uh, because of the ways by which indigenous communities appropriate, engage what are effectively colonial systems of order. In the summer of 2002, my father, Juan Camacho, and I had breakfast at Shirley's, a popular Chinese-owned restaurant in Guam. I was on island to conduct interviews for my dissertation on war memory and commemoration. We placed our order with the staff, including a request for two cups of coffee. As we waited, I shared my research findings with my dad, a Chamorro from Saipan who migrated to Guam in 1968 and who married my mother, Barbara, shortly thereafter. I explained how I visited various archives in Washington, Washington DC and College Park, Maryland, only a few weeks after the attacks in September 11, 2001. And although I knew that Chamorro interpreters like Louis Chrysostomo had existed, their histories as interrogators of Japan and as war criminals of the United States had not been fully examined, let alone understood. My interest in this matter then peaked when I stumbled upon a document that listed 76 Chamorros who served as interpreters in Guam on the official website for American Memorial Park, a U.S. national monument in Saipan. Authored by Antonio de Leon Guerrero on February 8, 1984, the document sought, quote, compensation to these people on the, or their surviving relatives for enduring, an, for enduring an unfortunate experience during the war. While de Leon Guerrero did not identify the source for said compensation, his disclosure of numerous Chamorro interpreters and police officers confounded my naive understanding that only a handful of men performed such tasks. Given that my father's extended family hails from Saipan, I clearly wanted to know if we were, in fact, related to these men in any way. When I broached the matter to him, the two cups of coffee had finally arrived. He, respond, he responded, can you please pass the sugar? My father's subsequent silence signaled the postponement of this conversation and the onset of my new project on the U.S. Navy's War Crimes Tribunals program in Guam. After the completion of my dissertation in 2005, I began to conduct research, conduct research at Archives New Zealand, the Australian War Memorial, the Micronesian Area Research Center, the Hoover Institution, the United Nations, and the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration, among other uh, collections. Along the way, my father gradually became interested in my research projects, as well as more candid about his knowledge of our family's role in the war. I found out, for example, that the Japanese military in Saipan attempted to drown my grandfather, the late Francisco Camacho, in a water and food container exclu exclusively used by pigs. He was suspected of being a spy for Americans, an allegation that affected many Asians and Pacific Islanders in China, Korea, the Marshall Islands, Okinawa, Palau, the Philippines, and elsewhere. As my, Barbara, uh, as my mother Barbara would attest, the Japanese military likewise punished Chamorros in Guam, even killing anybody for the slightest suspicion of betrayal to Japan. As a native son born between these warring factions, one being American and another being Japanese, my research about the war has always been and is contentious, speculative, and empowering. Additionally, I reached out to survivors of the war and their descendants, Marikita Chrysostomo, the wife of Luis Chrysostomo, the interpreter featured in my opening remarks, is one such person. Born in 1923, Marikita accompanied Luis, her husband, to Guam at the age of 20. In my interview, my father Juan joined us, as did her granddaughter, as did Marikita's granddaughter and great-grandchildren. In the living room in Saipan, in San Roque, a lifelike photo of Marikita and her husband, then deceased, graced the home. I immediately noticed his muscular frame and understood why the Japanese police recruited him for several torture sessions in Guam. After talking about our familial relations, I then gradually transitioned to the war, asking if she remembers how the Chamorro interpreters and Japanese police officers treated people suspected of crimes. Marikita replied, stating that, quote, they would put the person in the sun and start slapping them, end quote. After the war, she also acknowledged the US, that the U.S. Navy imprisoned 
her husband for several years, and that all the Japanese businesses in Saipan had closed. At one point, her granddaughter interjected in our conversation, saying, quote, Auntie Marikita used to make roschetti, a chamorro a cookie, a chamorro cookie, roschetti is a chamorro cookie. She used to make it, but stopped when she began to have pain in her hands. She forced me to learn. We all laugh. Much like the making of this cookie, a process that threaded the dough into a knot, I had realized that while Marikita had passed on her knowledge of how to prepare food, she did not relay the violence of the tribunal to her grandchildren. Her memory is hid in the crevices of the cookie, only to periodically surface in her conversation. Out of Scambuluri, the son of the late Adolfo Scambuluri, similarly shared fragmented memories of the tribunal. Reflecting upon his father's role as a police officer for the US Navy in Guam during the 1930s, he noted, quote, before the war, my father was the police officer in charge to conduct surveillance of every German in Guam and every Japanese. So, for example, they conducted surveillance on a fellow by the name of Mr. George Shar, the other Germans on island like the Wustigs, and then the Japanese, everybody from the Shinaharas to Tanakas and to the Sudo family. My father had information. That objective was to ascertain whether they were actually sympathetic to the Japanese cause and the Germans, end quote. Adolf then talked about his father's knowledge of Japanese military torture in Guam, as well as his father's post-war post -war role as a witness in the American prosecution of alleged war criminals in the tribunal. In this photo, he also shared me, with me a story about a Japanese soldier who often visited his family during the war. The unidentified soldier took a liking to Adolf's great auntie, then a young woman at the time, but never forced his way into their home. When the US military started to bomb Guam in the spring of 1944, the soldier approached Adolf's relatives, reiterated his fondness for his auntie, and pulled a, fold, pulled a folded US flag that was tucked away and hidden beneath his khaki uniform. The soldier then said to the effect, quote, give this flag to your daughter. I'm a Japanese from California and went to school at Cal Berkeley. I then got drafted in Japan by the army right before the war broke out between Japan and the United States, end quote. To this day, Adolf's family keeps this, this flag in memory of the soldier, itself an entangled trans-Pacific story of love and loss, migration and militarism, and war and racism that resonates in recent publications by Ichiro Ozuma, Greg Dvorak, Tak Fujitani, the late Teresia Teawa, and many others. These themes appear in my book as well, but unfortunately, not everybody was as forthcoming about the tribunal. For one, I knew that about five or, five or six Chamorro interpreters were alive during my researching of this book, yet nobody came forward to discuss, to discuss their histories. Only Ben Camacho, my uncle from Saipan, <coughs> volunteered to share his experiences as a member of the Kempatai, or Japanese secret police. He was, the only, he was the only person who agreed to talk about the war, including his pride as a former Japanese colonial subject. As he expressed, I was born in Saipan in 1929. I grew up with the Japanese. I told them I was Japanese, and I really enjoyed the Japanese style, end quote. When I asked Ben how the secret, secret police recruited him, he simply replied, quote, because of good grades, because I was, I was a valedictorian in the third grade and in the fifth grade, end quote. He then discussed his role as a messenger and signal caller, as well as explained how he almost left for Guam to serve as an interpreter. In fact, the Japanese military had already planned to secretly transfer him to Guam. But the Chamorro who had delivered, who had delivered this secret message to Ben had also informed his mother about the military's plans. Uh, so, you know, do not share secrets with Chamorros, <laughs> especially in the age of Facebook. So his mother then protested the police's decision. According to Ben, she said, please excuse my son because my husband works under the, military, um, under the military under forced labor. Nobody would be there at the house to help, so please excuse him. If my husband was with us, no problem. But my husband has been working for the military and my son cannot leave, end quote. In a rare occurrence, the secret police accepted her pleas and Ben Camacho remained in Saipan for the rest of the war. 
The other men, his cousins and my uncles, left for Guam where they broke teeth and cracked bones, killed men and injured others, and above all, severed the cultural ties and obligations between the villages and islands of this archipelago. Such torture tactics and atrocities later reappeared in the U.S. military tribunal as the U.S. Navy sought to punish Japanese subjects and possess Chamorro lands, all in the name of Victor's justice. Jorge Cristobal, the central interpreter for the Navy's military tribunal, embodied this nexus of racism and retribution in Guam, a central subject in my book. But when I interviewed him in May 2006, he discussed his relationship with Jesus and Mother Mary for nearly two hours. Nearly two hours. <laughs> I grew up Catholic. I don't go to church, sorry. But whenever my family, I go to every freaking Catholic function imaginable. So imagine me two hours. But in that time span, he only spent 10 minutes on the tribunal. On this point, he explained, on this point, he explained, the accused war criminals that were caught here in Guam, there were 16 or 17 of those guys that really know the locations of where the enemies are. But they very silent sometimes. They won't talk anything at all. But common sense will tell you, if you ask them, why did you kill them? He's not going to tell why. At that time, they were pretty well stunned too. Their mind is not clear. In Cold War Ruins, Trans-Pacific Critique of American Justice and Japanese War Crimes, Lisa Yoniyama writes, quote, a spatial and temporal concept. Ruins are in fact traces of geo-historical geo violence. There, one comes to know the loss, but only when it is too late, after this knowledge has already been compromised and impaired. Yet, when critically illuminated, Ruins are repositories of debris that in the present offer wisdom associated with failed strategies, unrealized possibilities, and paths that could have but were never taken." End quote. Indeed, I wrote my book on law, torture, and retribution after the U.S. Navy had already asserted its post-war claims to Guam and the wider Marianas archipelago. One might view loss, even failure, from this angle, knowing that Chamorros may have lacked the political agency and authority to challenge the colonial reach of both Japan and the United States in a naval courtroom. But when we take Lisa's charge about ruin seriously, then we can seize upon the unrealized possibilities in and beyond the Navy's War Crimes Tribunal's program. After all, Jorge Cristobal's daughter-in-law the former senator and longtime activist Hope Cristobal has led the charge for a demilitarized world in Guam and the Pacific. On the continued U.S. militarization of Guam, she had this to say, quote, the fact remains that the lands held by the military are contested spaces and the Chamorro people have never given consent for these uses, whether they be live fire exercises, testings of various munitions or such. The physical destruction of our central home and central home our borough grounds and cultural spaces and surrounding coastal areas is not and never will be acceptable. Thank you. So the, in, 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 in the tribunal in Guam, um, majority of these Chamor men and Japanese nationals were sentenced to death. Mm -hmm. And so I, I talk more explicitly about uh, Agamben and State of Exception and um, Benjamin and Foucault, I really try to take stock of and struggle and still do with these philosophies of violence, coupling with them with Chamorro understandings of violence. You know, the, 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 the inverse of reciprocity is retribution. And so I kind of like, I, I piggyback on some proverbs about that, uh, um, and that are metaphorical, that, that, are, that are critical, that are ontological in my view, but Execution-wise, uh, what happened was um, uh, the U.S. Navy, whenever there's a, a sentence of death, it has to go up to the Secretary of the Navy. And the Navy, uh, the Secretary essentially pardoned those executions. 
right? But as per Agamben, they were included, excluded. They were brought into, they're not U.S. citizens, right? they were brought into this, into this tribunal, expunged to death, right? Uh, or sentencing of. So there was no actual execution of Chamo subjects that I know of, but there were of Japanese nationals. Um, and I talk about one of the cases in my book, but I, I've actually tried to refrain from some of the spectacle of that atrocity, both atrocity as a historical issue, but atrocity as a mnemonic device in the courts, right? Uh, trying to really stress how these folks are grappling with uh, litigation and juridical and cultural mistranslation, those kinds of things. But uh, yeah, the, there was no uh, known execution of indigenous subjects, but there were of Japanese colonial subjects. So, um, thank you for the uh, question, and that actually covers a lot of things. So, I'm going to answer in the way that um, um, two, it, two things. One is um, in relationship to um, the Unit 371 in, in relationship to comfort women issue, and um, why um, I was focusing on 90s, 1990s, why it's so important. So um, some of you might know <laughs> the uh, volume that um, Tak and Jeff and I edited, Perilous mm -hmm. Memories. Um, that sort of came out of a, um, a moment of uh, what seemed like a post-Cold War moment. Uh, so there was a post-Cold War, official post-Cold War dissolution of Soviet Union um, you know, in the Western Hemisphere never happened in the you know, um, Eastern Hem quote unquote, Eastern Hemisphere. So the Cold War is not really over. There's North Korea and DRC. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the post-Cold War moment actually, in fact, allowed so many different memories to come out. Comfort Women was one. The other was Unit 371. Um, um, NHK documentary was produced. Um, the other is um, um, the kind of um, clandestine uh, operation of selling of the peaceful use of the atom. So that documentary too was also came out in 1990s, Eisenhower's, um, under the Hi Eisenhower and um, Kishi. Um, so, you know, all sorts of um, like issues, the unredressed um, atrocities, war injuries, um, you know, violence against women, um, they, the memories are sort of came out, testimonies came out. Um, you know, in Europe too, it was a 90s was an age of testimony. Um, that just like that, that was happening. So Perry's memories was a kind of euphoric moment. I, I kind of look back on our own work and think that, you know, it was 90s had so much potential. The things got gone so many different ways. Like Cold War might have ended. Um, issues that had never been addressed and redressed might have been redressed. Um, but never happened. Um, so 90s is another failure moment. Um, but um, so that's, that is why 90s is important. Um, the other thing, um, uh, I, I, I'll say two more things. One is, um, and stop me if I'm going too long. Um, but the other thing is, um, so comfort women issue has been going on for uh, more, than, more than 25 years, right? Um, that's more than one quarter century. And, Still being talked about, especially like for I'm talking to young, you know undergraduates and you know 18, 19 year old uh, students, you know like I tell them about the history and they discover them like for the first time, um, and you know become mobilized. That's fine, um, but you know it has gone through so many different phases. So um, so when the testimony happened in 1990, immediately there was yet another state to state. Uh, attempt to reconcile this, right? So there was a um, state level. So, you know, the sort of the usual um, discussion is that Japan never apologized. How come Japan ne Japanese never apologized? But in fact, from the Japanese government's perspective, they have been apologizing over and over and over, and they just don't get why the apology is not enough, um, because it's not a state, state, you know, state official apology. But, um, but the, you know, the initial moment when uh, a comfort women testimony really kind of unsettled, um, you know, all sorts of uh, accepted I understandings, <coughs> I think there was a kind of a moment in various communities that I should have known this. Why is it that I never problematized? Because they, you know, so-called comfort women have been written up in literature, documentary, you know, uh, Oshima has this, um, you know, a film that features, um, 
you know, um, sor sort of a figure of a Kampo women. So they were there, but were never problematized, right? So, um, but things have changed a bit. Uh, and now I think it has kind of become a kind of a universal, um, kind of mono uh, mobilized into universal sort of global feminist kind of paradigm a UN-centered um, violence against women, uh, women's human rights uh, kind of issue. So I think that is a, a bit different from the, way, the moment when um, you know, it came out. 2015, I don't know if you remember, but 2015, there was another agreement to settle this between South Korean government and Japanese government. And of course, dangerous women, quote unquote, um, turned by Elaine Kim and Cho Mo Che, um, you know, they rejected this, they protested the South, government, South Korean government's you know, agreement. Um, so once again, that was right, um, because it's, uh, so it's a kind of um, you know, dialectic process that's been happening, but I, I do notice that kind of um, universalization of this issue, which kind of loses the original um, uncertain qualities, it's still there. Um, but so when I was writing the book, I was kind of really depressed, and I almost wanted to just end with, um, you know, every justice is corrupt. Uh, every justice will be a state appropriated. But that's not true. Uh, there's always remainder, and so was um, transitional justice at World War II, at the end of World War II. So that's the way I ended writing, ended up writing the book. The other thing um, is that, you know, Cold War is not just U.S. Soviet Union. So there's PRC, Thai, um, Taiwan, or national, um, Nationalist Party. So, um, you know, there's a mass clemency um, that which was a, a PR, Chiang Kai-shek as well, as, but uh, more famously, um, you know, the Zhou Enlai had a mass clemency policy to, in fact, forgive um, Japanese POWs. Um, so that was a kind of a gesture on the part of the new nation to claim its sovereignty to forgive, right? So that's the sort of exercise of its own um, sovereignty, um, adjudicate and also, you know, forgive. Um, so I, I think, you know, I also talk about that in the book too. So it's not just the U.S., but there's also regional Cold War um, that had a huge effect on the memories of war. And that has been sort of serving as a, you know, undercurrent to, um, you know, um, sort of still ongoing redressive uh, effort, I think. Uh, I can say more about it. Thank yeah, I should be too. Thank you for the question. I, uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, Kamacho, uh, can you just you know, give more information as to how many uh, you know, people were prosecuted in the, uh, the Guam Tribunal, you know, and, uh, uh, and what the result of the, those tribunals have been? And the other question is, uh, <clears throat> did Guam have any, you know, legal status as an independent independent nation, or do people on Guam want independence, or they want to just go along with the uh, U.S. <laughs> occupation? Uh, uh, what's the background, uh, you know, history and desire of the Guam people? Thank you. It, I just came from Toronto to talk to Lisa. We had similar conversation, and talk made a good point for Jatani about the civilizing hierarchies, so to speak, of like Class A, B, and C war crimes mm -hmm. uh, trials. So the Guam trial, um, uh, Class I think Class B crimes against humanity, and you have like uh, Tokyo Nuremberg Class A, right, nation to nation whereas BECs are like person-to-person -person combatants, right? And it's, these are all vestiges, spillovers of, of the political orders of the war and the new political orders and normals of post-war, the kind of Cold War um, uh, um, issue that Lisa really nicely unpacks in her, in her book. So the, in that regard, the, going back to the legal status question, it was, uh, um, uh, the, the United States, this is where I, I'm treating the trial, the tribunal is not simply as a, as a he said, 
she said, you know, innocent, guilty thing, but it was really an a, a enunciation of sovereignty in the part of the United States because these are all Japanese colonies, right? So um, it's the first uh, expression of, of U.S. jurisprudence, really. The first trial occurred in um, December 44 in Guam. There's still, you know, and so the, uh, um, and, I, and it's from, it's from the, tri in, the, in the book I talk more about, you know, the tribunal and, and states of exception, all these different things. So um, for Japan, the United States, the sovereignty was always up for grabs for them. But I think in greater Oceania and Asia, you know, where um, under the League of Nations mandates, or under League of Nations, you know, even the mandates are even tears, right? You know, oh, um, former German colonies will be taken up by these countries, et cetera. But they won't be countries on their own accord, right? And so you have that kind of uh, um, ward, uh, like, um, how do I put this? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it can be it can be infantilized, you know, parent child relationship, ward state relationship, throughout the Pacific. But I think the tribunal was so central to the United States in in that kind of like uh, lesser than international uh, ordering of you know, um, Republic of China, Korea, Germany, etc. That they were like secondary that way, right? And didn't um, I think if if this tribunal had the spotlight of you know a greater community people were like what's going on here but japan and the united states were treating not just Guam but greater micronesia like a cold war salt water lake right uh trying to seize upon uh, uh their sovereignty these island <coughs> sovereignties but uh there was a, a probably like 40 50 trials in in the in, the, in this particular case mm -hmm. and um you know, have a lot having to do with uh, um, expunging everything Japanese from the archipelago and, and, and making uh, U.S. Um, juridical, uh, you know, orders uh, moral, leave virtuous, and, and you know, um, lawfully uh, sound. This is what the U.S. was, was thinking. But I, I ended the talk on the ruins that Lisa talks about because even though these legal documents appear as, you know, may really show us the, the Guam as a colony. It could be used in, in current legal battles and other social movements, for instance, to uh, shed insight on the illegalities, really, of both Japan and the United States, which very much differ from greater parts, other parts of the French Pacific or the British Pacific, or, you know, um, Dutch, Asia Pacific around this time. But there are no you know, movement for independence? There, there are. There have been, there have been uh, all forms of movements for independence. Um, you know, I was at the United Nations here 20 years ago or something like that. And, you know, every time we come here to petition to the United Nations, the U.S. delegate's either not there or is there and votes no against us, right? I, when I was here, I think we voted with we a bunch of folks after uh, the Committee of 24, you know, Committee de Decolonization. Um, they say, all right, thank you, Guam, have a good day, kind of thing, and, you know, the translators are putting up this stuff, and, you know, New Caledonia's coming up next, or some, you know, some other countries coming up next, and, and I, I will not forget, it was three countries that came up to us to say good luck. One was uh, the Congo, one was Iran, and one was, I think, Fiji, from the Pacific. And, you know, Fiji's like, uh, when you... When you find out how to get rid of the United States, let us know. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about um, your understanding of military colonial power? And, um, and I, I think this might be a question that would be relevant to the both of you because um, in Hawaii, as an example, people in the 1940s, specifically Native Hawaiians, are opposing statehood and trying to argue for a military commission form of government. And they're specifically looking at Guam and Samoa because in their minds, at least Tomoros are able to control immigration, or at least there's no immigration coming in, at least not, um, um, not individual citizens. And in Samoa, they're able to maintain their land. But 
in a post-war moment, there's that military commission form of power, but it seems to kind of change, or does it change, after the establishment of the Organic Act and Gulf Guam? And is that when you see more of a kind of um, the beginning processes of like settler colonial power that is? Because in Hawaii, the, the assumption is that military and white settlers are always in cahoots, but in actuality, they're um, many times in opposition. Um, and the military is always kind of trying to actually establish a military commission form of government, basically arguing that the white settlers are unfit for self-government. They're not actually able to maintain a racial order that, that allows for, you know, at least for a lot of the naval uh, officers were from the South, so they were saying that the form of racial etiquette is not being replicated in the way that they saw fit, right? Um, and that's kind of like the Massey case and all those kinds of things. But I guess it's just a kind of question about like, how does military colonial power change when civilian government sort of come into power? And that is itself also a kind of constrained project because they're themselves not really given any kind of like, like plenary power is still in existence, right? So I guess I'm just trying to like wrap my mind around how things sort of change as time progresses in like places like Wuhan. I, I, I um, thank you, Dean. It's it's, it's a, a good question, a lot to unpack. I think um, we can approach uh, Dean's question on multiple registers and scales. On the one hand, the Department of Interior is the governing agency of all territories, um, and and of particularly flora, fauna, and animals, mm. right? And so from that angle. Uh, we already know that territories are not part of the union. Provisional citizenship, <coughs> provisional inclusion, right? So uh, 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 always states of exception, right? And then at the more local, <coughs> regional scale, right, you have um, different client-patron relations, whether it's, you know, from older plantation economies in, in the Caribbean and Puerto Rico and, you know, the kind of like its own merchant classes. You have Philippines in our post-colonial state in a way but I think in, like in Guam, Hawaii, American Samoa, those things are playing out differently mm -hmm. because it's very situational in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, in Guam and Greater Micronesia, they're an almost mirror image of Japan's militarization of the region where Japan saw Micronesia as a buffer zone from the United States and other Western powers. And the United States reproduced that in its, uh, in its uh, in, in assertion of both you know, um, nuclear energy and nuclear warfare. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I think uh, with the new uh, government, self governments uh, that have, have emerged post war in, in indigenous Pacific, U.S. Pacific rather, um, they're they're all, they're always provisional. Mm -hmm. They're always provisional because of the not the Department of Interior's uh, commitment to national security, military security in the region. Right, and. Um, as, as Dean and a lot of you know, that a lot of these places here are ongoing states of exception. You know, a lot of these countries that might vote in the United Nations, they're always voting uh, with the United States, much like Japan and, and South Korea, specific nations. Um, and um, what's that? Uh, um, because of, you know, U.S. first Cold War now, post 9-11. But what's interesting, I shared this in, in Toronto with, with Lee Santa. Remember Pompeo coming down? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Secretary uh, State is that, uh, of coming down to uh, one of the, the Pacific Islands, Chuuk State in particular, you know, him like other diplomats are so busy. Why would they want to come down to this Pacific state? It's because this one particular Pacific state is courting the Republic of China, right? And if that if that if that courting unfolds and materializes, you have one state, the Republic of China, and this indigenous state shaken up the security complex that's tethered to Hawaii, to South Korea, to Indonesia, arms cells, to a, a rising socialist, communist, capitalist Vietnam. I mean, it's all, it's all um, uh, money and security interests, right? So of course, the Department of Interior, Department of State is gonna make a public spectacle and try to you know, sway to keep this an American lake. So all these forms of citizenship and national inclusion and recognition, in my view, at least in the Pacific, U.S. Pacific, are provisional. Mm -hmm. But because they're provisional, they're still up for grabs, which is why, like, you know, a lot of indigenous sovereignty movements of different sorts and shapes are really meaningful, 
because when we think of like cityscapes here, we think of the challenges here, whether it's New York or the state here, you know, a lot of the people in the region there are thinking and acting critically where we can change these status ways. We can do it, and this is how we're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's ready, I mean, um, but I feel this is where like a lot of our work still needs to catch up with some of those new movements and, you know, but it is a, it's an ongoing provisional um, inclusion. Thank you so much. Um, this is just such a wonderful panel. Thank you, everyone. Um, Professor Yonayama, I'm a big fan of your book. Um, thank you. And, but actually, my question is for uh, Professor Camacho. Um, I, I really was struck by the, the, the individual stories in your presentation um, and just how complicated and slippery they were. You know, when you talked about the different sides of the family, the Americanized family, the Japan, Japanified uh, side of the family. And I wondered, um, what, what do you do with the question of complicity um, with that, with, you know, obviously, you know, looking at the larger frame and the, um, the way the tribunal gets instrumentalized for reproduction of militarized colonial power. Um, and yet there was that, that quote that ended, you know, um, their minds were not clear, the, the quote that when one of them was asked, you know, why did you kill? So I just wondered, like, how do we, how do we theorize complicity without falling into, like, reinscribing the kinds of, you know, U.S. hegemonic militarized power? I just wondered if, if that was, or, or how did you deal with that in your methodology? Because I, I sensed that there was, there was so much of this interesting, um, interesting stories that came out with your, with your subject. Yeah, thank you. I think the complicity question to me is uh, um, is an angle that's not really fully fleshed out, not just in Pacific studies, but in American studies, ethnic studies. You know, it's always easy to critique, uh, you know, the white man, right? And it's true, and I think there's valid validity in that. But I feel that um, with regard to uh, the Marianas context, complicity helps us to unpack uh, the motivations, the, the desires, the anxieties, uh, uh, the slippages, the, the, the fears, the wants the lo that, that these folks go through. But it also helps us to, you know, um, really uh, hold these empires up mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and, and see these kind of competing scales, uh, ontological, epistemological, uh, economic, you know. Um, and I feel that with indigenous scapes in particular in Oceania, not just the Marianas, um, you know, these are all really <clears throat> new modernities, you know. Um, and as, as many a diplomat would tell you, and as many a colonial broker and folks would tell you that on the ground, a lot of these, you know, things that how they play out are much more uh, nuanced and messy because of complicity or because of protest, because of these things on, on the ground. And um, I always joke, I have this lecture on the Spanish and the Marianas, and I ask my students, what do you think folks thought in the early 1600s when, you know, these conquistadors were on our shores reading the proclamations, you know? They're like, who's that fool? What is he doing standing there by himself, right? Uh, and I feel that, so you have like these, this is not to dismiss and discount what are, you know, National international flows of power and real politic, but I think the matter of complicity really uh, humanizes these communities. Really, kind of helps us really take <coughs> out of these things. Um, and when you think of the scholarship, you know, Lisa's book really is a, is cutting against the grain of the good war, right? The good war, you know. And I feel like these kinds of um, issues really flesh out how that was not so good for so many people, you know. But also, what might have been their motivations. Um, I also was teasing, I was teasing, I was meeting talk, uh, and Lisa and Dean, I was joking with these folks earlier, I said, I'm just gonna show some of these little oral histories as a teaser in case you wanna go buy the book. <laughs> yeah, 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 and you can also buy Lisa's book together, buy all the, tis the season, you know, it's the holiday, tis the season, you know, uh, uh, sharing is caring, you know, yeah, so, but no, that's a great question. I mean, complicity, I think for me, is, is something that I feel just, really adds to our critical vernaculars, you know, and I feel a lot of our fields would just only be further enriched that way. Can I ask a follow question? Because I get to be up here and with you guys. So, um, 
there's a way that you also talk about complicity um, of indigenous epistemology with state ideology. Mm -hmm. And there's that kind of thin line between epistemology and ideology. And it seems like it would shake up critical indigenous theory and indigenous studies, especially as it's articulated via indigenous resurgence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if that was deliberate on your part, but I mean, but it definitely is compelling. And I think there's a lot of folks who are kind of doing the kind of speculative fiction or, or kind of thinking critically about certain kinds of futures as like indigenous fascist futures, right? Like, to what extent can certain kinds of epistemologies be co-opted and justices become co-opted under the, under the idea that these are indigenous epistemologies and native languages? I, I think the, the, as Dean is referencing in, in, in Sacred Men, you know, the, I'm, I'm making this claim that indigenous epistemologies, particularly through native testimonies, uh, shaped and co-determined had a causal factor in these tribunals. Uh, and, but the, the causality was one premise on vengeance mm -hmm. and hate mm -hmm. and, and, and death mm -hmm. and, and harm. But the subtext to that whole argument, the inverse, or the, the, the subtext, the, the related coupling of that is, is that, you know, here is an example of indigenous vernaculars infusing this, this juridical system mm -hmm. through this threshold that is the state of exception, right? And, you know, what would happen if that was for the better? What was that, would that, if that was, if that, if those vernaculars were for uh, a reciprocal future, an alternative future, rather than one based on vengeance, mm -hmm. right? Because we now know these things can happen, but it happened in these terms. You know, how can it happen in other terms, right? Which is in part Agamben's conundrum about law generally. You know, law is, is extremely punitive. How can we turn it in a, in a way where it's much more uh, truly inclusive and doesn't have the reliant animal human distinction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So those are things that I think I'm struggling with and trying to flesh out. But that is, it, even though it is, it takes this necropolitical, really death vengeance angle, it's, it also has, which I really like the ruins, you know, that mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's promise in what we think of as a failure. Mm -hmm. There's also promise. And I, I think the little oral histories are snippets of that, you know. Cristobo, the last interpreter I featured, he was the number one interpreter. There was more than 100 testimonies, mostly indigenous testimonies in his court. He was the number one interpreter for the court. But look, his daughter-in-law is like, you know, keeps asking Uncle Sam, when are you gonna leave, mm -hmm. right? And so there's this, you know, this is the, what we think of as a failure is not necessarily a failure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just, uh, sort of a short follow-up on the issue of complicity. I, I just, it strikes me that in some ways it's, uh, a, a sort of a counterpart to the important point that Lisa Yonayama makes about the determination of what is redressable and non-redressable as violence um, in the sense that the, the, the question of whether someone is, uh, an act is complicit or is just being a cooperative colonial subject, right, is quite um, you know, fungible and contingent and really the, the issue of whether you're complicit or someone is complicit or not then reveals, it illuminates the larger structures of power um, that are operating it's similarly to um, uh, how the question of redress illuminates structures of power operating in, in Cold War systems of justice. I, I just would just ask if, if uh, maybe Lisa could speak to that um, issue about redressability and, and complicity. Um, hmm. I wonder, um, actually, I'm not sure if I can um, answer to your immediate question, but um, it is true that we have not been able to talk about collaborators <coughs> other than just collaborators. So I think, um, you know, we do need um, a kind of language about complicity that doesn't reduce complicity into one identity or other essence. Um, and it, but in order to do that, we really need to do something else, really, you know, materially, like transform um, the order of the state formation or the way we think, uh, or both, probably both. Mm -hmm. But um, so I was thinking about the, uh, in terms of question complicity, collaboration, and collaborators, I think, um, 
you know, we, we need a new language w w which comes with the material transcript, I think. But this, this, that's going to come out on Thank you so much for, for this panel. Um, I wanted to ask about um, kind of what is undergirding the architecture that you identify, um, Lisa, and then thinking about kind of the undercurrents in um, the oral histories you shared with us, Keith, um, which is about death and how, you know, in so many ways, the, the way that the, the good war is good because supposedly the right people <laughs> died, <laughs> right? And, um, and it also in thinking about um, that, that, and that death is so present. And, and when, um, when you were speaking, Keith, about how um, uh, people were, were remembering um, the executions but not willing to necessarily, right, um, go too, too much further into talking about, um, about that. Um, so I was just wondering if, um, again, not to keep on going with Ginny's um, question about complicity, but is there something about, um, as you were doing the work and the research, um, that there's something about how people um, are working through death um, and uh, working through whether or either their own responsibilities to or how to um, understand their own position to um, these deaths. Um, these spirits <laughs> um, that perhaps opens up a different way of thinking about um, complicity and the hum and and the humanness, right? Um, that also doesn't rely on that architecture, right? Um, that Lisa, you that you so beautifully lay out for us. Um, that that doesn't have to be the architecture through which, right? Um, to um, uh, to recognize or um, uh, or be accountable to death, right? Because I, I think it, because that's exactly where the state can come in and co-opt. So. I can't agree with you more. Um, yeah, that's that's precisely where the state actually comes in, like drawing the line. But the, but I guess the in terms of redress, yeah, in terms of redress, I, I don't think it really ends with the physical death. It's so it's 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 really aftermath, mm -hmm. aftermath of death. Mm -hmm. So in a way, um, I mean this is now a cliche, it might sound like cliche, but people who are in redress, like really radical redress movements, are haunted uh, by the mm -hmm. and cannot reconcile one's own immediate relationship to the death that they witnessed or caused or inherited. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just add to, add to what you said. Yeah, no, I just, want, just to piggyback on that, there, there is that haunting. Um, I, I think um, your, your question made me think of a talk I, I gave a few years ago that never transformed into a paper, paper publication. <laughs> yeah, bad student, bad student. You know, me, bad student. But, uh, but um, it was on redress. And there was um, um, efforts in Guam for, uh, for the, to ask the United States to provide them with monetary redress for the things they suffered in Guam. And essentially, in short form, I was like, no. Let's not take on these status, you know, forms of redress or reconciliation because precisely how they're co-opted or reproduced in certain terms. And because, as many legal scholars would say, it forecloses other forms of redress, right? And, and I was like, and, 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 and so, but it made me think about broader kind of like periodizing temporal frames, you know, um, internment in California frame. U.S. military in Hawaii frame, Japan, U.S. Mariana's temporal spatial frame. And I feel that piggybacking, Lisa, the more we invest in those status forms, the more we harden those frames mm -hmm. and make it difficult, as Dean and others have shown, to, to create these vernaculars or to season the vernaculars for a mutual and uneasy translation between communities around whatever justice they kind of, you know, uh, co cohere around, kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I'm a hater that way, you know, <laughs> but, but, um, but I, I know Noelani Goodyear writes, you know, uh, on Hawaiian charter schools as, mm -hmm. as a kind of, um, you know, uh, a seizing of um, 
non-status forms of uh, uh, critical thinking and practices, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I feel there's more of those things that, you know, that I think need to kind of open up, you know. Uh, and, and we have a lot of work to do, you know, when we think about these security states, but uh, the, these things do haunt us, and, and thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're out of time, so thank you so much to Lisa and Keith. Yeah.